Hello everybody and welcome back to Quarantine Kids Storytime. My name's Sasha Cooper and I'm the co-founder of this project. Today I'm going to be continuing The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Now if you remember yesterday, we met Carr the Python. He has now teamed up with Baloo and Bagheera as they head towards the cold layers to rescue Mowgli from the monkeys. Shall we see what happens next? Then I'll begin. They all knew where that place was, but few of the jungle people ever went there, because what they called the cold layers was an old, deserted city, lost and buried in the jungle, and beasts seldom use a place that men have once used. The wild boar will, but the hunting tribes do not. Besides, the monkeys lived there as much as they could be said to live anywhere and no self-respecting animal would come within eyeshot of it, except in times of drought, when the half-ruined tanks and reservoirs held a little water. It is half a night's journey at full speed, said Bagheera, and Baloo looked very serious. I will go as fast as I can, he said anxiously. We dare not wait for thee. Follow, Baloo. We must go on the quick foot, Car and I. Feet or no feet, I can keep abreast of all thy four, said Carr shortly. Baloo made one effort to hurry, but had to sit down, panting. And so they left him to come on later, while Bagheera hurried forward at the quick panther canter. Carr said nothing, but strive as Bagheera might, the huge rock python held level with him. When they came to a hill stream, Bagheera gained because he bounded across while Carr swam, his head and two feet of his neck clearing the water. But on level ground, Carr made up the distance. By the broken lock that freed me, said Bagheera when Twyat had fallen, thou art no slow goer. I am hungry, said Carr. Besides, they called me Speckled Frog. Worm, earthworm, and yellow to boot. All one, let us go on. And Carr seemed to pour himself along the ground, finding the shortest road with his steady eyes and keeping to it. In the cold layers, the monkey people were not thinking of Mowgli's friends at all. They had brought the boy to the lost city and were very much pleased with themselves for the time. Mowgli had never seen an Indian city before, and though his Mowgli had never seen an Indian city before, and though this was almost a heap of ruins, it seemed very wonderful and splendid. Some king had built it long ago on a little hill. You could still trace the stone causeways that led up to the ruined gates where the last splinters of wood hung to the worn, rusty hinges. Trees had grown in and out of the walls. The battlements were tumbled down and decayed, and wild creepers hung out of the windows of the towers on the walls in bushy, hanging clumps. A great roofless palace crowned the hill, and the marble of the courtyards and the fountains were split and stained with red and green, and the very cobblestones in the courtyard where the king's elephants used to live, had been thrust up and apart by grasses and young trees. From the palace, you could see the rows and rows of roofless houses that made up the city, looking like empty honeycombs filled with blackness. The shapeless block of stone that had been an idol in the square, where four roads met, the pits and dimples at street corners where the public wells once stood, and the shattered domes of temples with wild figs sprouting on their sides. The monkeys called the place their city and pretended to despise the jungle people because they lived in the forest. And yet, they never knew what the buildings were made for, nor how to use them. 
they would sit in circles on the hall of the king's council chamber and scratch for fleas and pretend to be men. Or they would run in and out of the roofless houses and collect pieces of plaster and old bricks in a corner and forget where they had hidden them, and also fight and cry in scuffling crowds, and then break off to play up and down the terraces of the king's garden, where they would shake the rose trees and the oranges in sport just to see the fruit and flowers fall. They explored all the passages and dark tunnels in the palace and the hundreds of little dark rooms. But they never remembered what they had seen and what they had not, and so drifted about in ones and twos all crowds, telling each other that they were doing as men did. They drank at the tanks and made the water all muddy. Then they fought over it, and then they would all rush together in mobs and shout, There is no one in the jungle so wise and good and clever and strong and gentle as the bandalog. Then they would all begin again till they grew tired of the city and went back to the treetops, hoping the jungle people would notice them. Mowgli, who had been trained under the law of the jungle, did not like or understand this kind of life. The monkeys dragged him into the cold layers late in the afternoon, and instead of going to sleep, as Mowgli would have done after a long journey, they joined hands and danced about and sang their foolish songs. One of the monkeys made a speech and told his companions that Mowgli's capture marked a new thing in the history of the Bandalog, for Mowgli was going to show them how to weave sticks and canes together as a protection against rain and cold. Mowgli picked up some creepers and began to work them in and out, and the monkeys tried to imitate, but in a very few minutes they lost interest and began to pull at their friends' tails or jump up and down on all fours, coughing. I wish to eat, said Mowgli. I am a stranger in this part of the jungle. Bring me food or give me leave to hunt here. Twenty or thirty monkeys bounded away to bring him nuts and wild pawpaws. But they fell to fighting on the road, and it was too much trouble to go back with what was left of the fruit. Mowgli was sore and angry as well as hungry, and he roamed through the empty city, giving the stranger's hunting call from time to time. But no one answered him, and Mowgli felt that he had reached a very bad place indeed. All that Baloo has said about the Bandalog is true, he thought to himself. They have no law or hunting call, and no leaders. Nothing but foolish words and little, picking, thievish hands. So if I am starved or killed here, oh, it'll be all my own fault. But I must try to return to my own jungle. Baloo will surely beat me but that is better than chasing silly rose leaves with the bandalog. No sooner had he walked to the city wall than the monkeys pulled him back, telling him that he did not know how happy he was and pinching him to make him grateful. Ow! He set his teeth and set nothing, but went with the shouting monkeys to a terrace above the red sandstone reservoirs that were half full of rainwater. There was a ruined summer house of white marble in the centre of the terrace, built for queens dead a hundred years ago. The domed roof had fallen in and blocked up the underground passage from the palace by which the queens used to enter. But the walls were made of screens of marble tracery, beautiful whelk white fretwork set with agates and cornelians and jasper and lapis lazuli, and as the moon came up behind the hill, it shone through the open work, casting shadows on the ground like black 
velvet embroidery. Sore, sleepy and hungry as he was, Mowgli could not help laughing when the bandalogue began, twenty at a time, to tell him how great and wise and strong and gentle they were, and how foolish he was to leave them. We are great! We are free! We are wonderful! We are the most wonderful people in all the jungle! We all say so, and so it must be true! they shouted. Now, as you are a new listener and can carry our words back to the jungle people so that they may notice us in future, we will tell you all about our most excellent selves. Mowgli made no objection, and the monkeys gathered by hundreds and hundreds on the terrace to listen to their own speakers singing the praises of the bandalogue. And whenever a speaker stopped for want of breath, they would all shout together, This is true! We all say so! Mowgli nodded and blinked, and said, Yes, when they asked him a question. And his head spun with the noise. Oh, Tabaki the jackal must have bitten all these people, he said to himself. And now they have madness. Certainly. This is Duane, the madness. Do they never go to sleep? Now, there was a cloud coming to cover that moon. If it were only a big enough cloud, I might try to run away in the darkness, but I am tired. That same cloud was being watched by two good friends in the ruined ditch below the city wall, for Bagheera and Carr knowing well how dangerous the monkey people were in large numbers, did not wish to run any risks. The monkeys never fight unless they are a hundred to one, and few in the jungle care for those odds. <laughs> I will go to the west wall, Carr whispered, and come down swiftly with the slope of the ground in my favour. They will not throw themselves upon my back in their hundreds. But I know it, said Bagheera, would that Baloo were here. But we must do what we can. When that cloud covers the moon, I shall go to the terrace. They hold some sort of council there over the boy. Good hunting, said Carr grimly and glided away to the west wall. That happened to be the least ruined of any, and the big snake was delayed a while before he could find a way up the stones. The cloud hid the moon, and as Mowgli wondered what would come next, he heard Bagheera's light feet on the terrace. The black panther had raced up the stone almost without a sound, and was striking. He knew better than to waste time in biting, right and left among the monkeys, who were seated round Mowgli in circles, fifty and sixty deep. There was a howl of fright and rage, and then, as Bagheera tripped on the rolling, kicking bodies beneath him, a monkey shouted, There is only one here! Kill him! Kill! A scuffling mass of monkeys biting, scratching, tearing and pulling, closed over Bagheera, while five or six laid hold of Mowgli, dragged him up the wall of the summer house and pushed him through the hole of the broken dome. A man-trained boy would have been badly bruised, for the fall was a good fifteen feet. But Mowgli fell as Baloo had taught him to fall and landed on his feet. And on that note, we're going to leave it there. My word, now that is an exciting episode. Tune in tomorrow to find out what happens to Mowgli next. Will Bagheera rescue him? Will Carr make his mark? And will Baloo catch up? My name's been Sasha Cooper, and this has been Quarantine Kids Storytime. Take care of yourselves, everybody, and stay safe in this uncertain time. Bye-bye.